Journalism is a fundamental part of democracy. Challenge assumptions, ask the right questions, follow the money, you know all the sayings. And oh yes, cover that royal baby. Well, we sure did that one last week. Pretty well, all of us. Was it the right call? And what did it say about the state of our business? Tonight, some talk on that. Here in Toronto, Margot Goodhand, former editor of the Winnipeg Free Press, and Jonathan Kay, columnist and managing editor for comment at the National Post. In Ottawa tonight, Ellie Alboim, associate professor of journalism at Carleton University, and in Vancouver, the host of Q, Jean Gameshi. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, some quick reminders. It's, it's the sun, we're being told, Anna. It's the sun. Perhaps the British satirical magazine Private Eye got it right. Maybe this was all that was necessary. Just another baby. <laughs> well, if it was, it sure isn't what we got. Well, hello from outside the Lindo Wing. Well, we'll be live here and at the hospital. And everyone is waiting. Instead, first we got hours of breathless reporting from outside a hospital with no royal patient yet inside. The media's been here for weeks and weeks. Then, when the royal mom-to-be actually arrived, she slipped in the back, off camera. Good morning. She's in labor. It's on. It's this on. This is what we've been waiting for. And what followed on camera for hours and hours and hours? Shots of a hospital door quickly made us famous as number 10. If you are just joining us, uh, you have had a much more eventful past hour than us. All this for the world's most glaring example of entitlement, an heir to the throne. There he is. Oh! The oh! There she is with her baby. And then, when the baby finally arrived, it was all gush all the time. Members of both families oh. have been informed or are delighted by the news. Oh. The Royal Highness and Quite some number of some hours ago, you can hear them cheering. Oh my God, William's going to drive. William is going to drive the range oh. home. Congratulations, Will and Kay. So, what should we make of all this royal baby stuff? Too much, over the top, or appropriate? All fun and no harm done. And what did it tell us about the current state of journalism? The frustrating wait for the royal baby to arrive is... From traditional media to all news, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube and everything in between. Plenty more to come from here, of course. None of it news. <laughs> oh, great line. Uh, look, before we start, let me, let me make one thing clear. The media is not a monolith, so we didn't all do the same thing. But I think it's fair to say that certainly in the Western media, we still call it that, uh, everybody got caught up with this story. The question is... Was it over the top? Margo, quick go around on this. Is it, was it over the top? I think I'm the only one in this room that can probably say that I got up for two royal weddings at 4 o'clock in the morning. So I am an unabashed royal watcher, and I think I share that with a lot of other people, probably gender divided. But, yeah, no, we didn't. I don't think so. And you're a serious journalist. <laughs> you won a lot of big awards. Ellie, what do you well, make of it? Yeah, sure it was over the top, but uh, on the other hand, it would have been really peculiar to most of the people watching if it hadn't been there. Um, it, it really goes to the heart of how you make these kinds of news decisions. Uh, but people wanted to see it, and they got it. We'll get to how we make those decisions in a sec. Jonathan? From my perspective, I thought it was over the top, but that's just me. Uh, when I saw the most visited items on the National Post website with the royal baby at one, two, three, and four, I changed my mind. <laughs> uh, you know, look, you had the merging of celebrity culture, uh, the sort of people who follow the baby making of uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z, merge that with the traditional monarchist political culture, and you have this perfect news story that appeals to two completely separate demographics. It was turned out to be a blockbuster, and it uh, doesn't matter what people like me think, what matters is that our public wanted to hear about it. Well, we'll get to that, too, because that is a fundamental question. Uh, Gian, where are you on this? No, it was definitely a blockbuster, and it was also definitely over the top. I mean, come on. <laughs> was, there, was there any serious observer or journalist anywhere in the world saying, we just didn't do enough on that story? <laughs> I, you know, we didn't get the scoop. We didn't quite really, you know, mind that subject. I think um, uh, it, was, uh, it was way over the top. And I say this, by the way, as a kid who was born in London, England, has an affection for many things British, go Arsenal, and who hosted an event <laughs> for the royal couple when, when they were in Ottawa. And they seemed very nice, but this was too much. What's the driver on a story like this? Why, why do we do stories like this, Ellie? Well, look, it's, it's, it's perfectly predictable. Uh, I don't think media had any choice. 
um, it was going to be what it was. And, and it goes to the kind of clash between, you know, what is truly important and what is truly interesting. And that's, that's a tension that media always tries to resolve as, as it makes news judgments. Uh, you heard people say that that's what the audience wanted. Um, what the audience wants versus what the audience needs to hear in the uh, judgment of journalists is another tension. Um, what's interesting and what's relevant drives most of what's on, on the news today. And frankly, if, if all we had was the important, then people would get relatively bored or turned off the news. Uh, sometimes you need a spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. Uh, the medicine is what may people need to know, but sometimes, but the uh, the sugar is what they want to know. Jean, you're uh, you're not agreeing on that. Well, it, it wasn't the spoonful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll concede it that. A, I'll concede it was that. a dollop. It was a, a you know. Uh, uh, but I, I, look, I think there was three things at work, Peter. I think I think first of all, this is big business. Uh, there's an industry around uh, the monarchy, the royal family, and the and the, the covering the royal baby, and and we all know that. Number two, it's a fairy tale. It's a fantasy, and it was um, a positive celebratory story at a time when the general public not just in North America but around the world is probably tired and feeling defeated and and uh, overwhelmed with negativity uh, but third and perhaps most importantly and this is something that John Cage has pointed out it, it it it's the apex of celebrity culture and a very simple narrative you put the convergence of all those three things and it makes it something that is uh, that where there's an appetite to cover this and oh, cover it big. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't make it the right call, though, in my opinion, for all the networks or, and, and newspapers, et cetera, But to there be is doing a so. huge, huge appetite for it. How can you take, it's like a J.K. Rowling story. How do you get the two poor princes who lost their beloved mother in a terrible car crash and then were raised by their dotty old kind of eccentric uh, father and you know, in this stuffy family I mean it, you want them to do well I think there's a real gripping you no know, I mean she couldn't write it better than that so you get this tremendous sense of I think feel good about this story because they it matters to us that those two boys do okay and well I, you know Jonathan you raised and Ellie you know talked about it as well this 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 argument between or this debate, and it's a historic one in news circles. It's been going on for decades. It didn't start last week. Between what's important, and, and, you know, and what what's interesting, you seem to be leaning last week on. Listen, they, that's what they want. That's what they find interesting. So, in a sense, that's what's important. To a certain extent, technology is now driving this. Uh, when I started in journalism 15 years ago, what was important was what my boss said was important. Uh, and then we discovered the hit counter on websites, uh, and my boss started to have to share his vote with what the public was telling us through the website hit counter they wanted. And so now the determination about what's news uh, is basically shared between senior editors and the democracy that takes place on the website about so what's the most it, popular story. So is that a story. good thing? Is that a good thing? Uh, it's good in the sense it adds an element of democracy. It's bad in the sense it creates a sort of sameness in the media. But, because but what, if you look at the stories that are across the hit counters all across the English language media, they were all registering the same baby story. So as a result, you had the entire media covering one story. Okay, Jean. Yeah. Well, I mean, this point keeps on being, people keep bringing up the point about the fact that there's uh, an appetite, that people want to see this, people want to hear this, there's, and, and page clicks and, and ratings, and um, we know that that's important it's, uh, to, to a certain extent. It's, it's a business even for public broadcasters, et cetera. Uh, but when is it the right decision? And I would suggest that, uh, you know, there's a line. I mean, look. The Bachelorette finale was on last night. We could spend half of the national debating, deconstructing what happened in the, the Bachelorette finale. Uh, why don't we do that? Well, we probably wouldn't do that because we don't consider it news that should lead uh, the broadcast or should be on the front page of the newspapers or should lead a show like Q. So where is the line for us? And, and what is the real cost? I mean, that's the question. You know, if we're spending as much time in real estate in the media as we are on something like the Royal Baby, and by the way, Nothing wrong with covering the royal baby. Love the royal baby. Go royal baby. <laughs> but, but if we're spending that much, what does it come at the cost of? And, and if, oh. you'll, if you'll just let me in, indulge me for a second, this was happening at the same time as Lac Megantic, the, the, the terrible tragedy there was still unfolding, as 
the recovery in the floods in Alberta is still happening. As a, 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 a verdict that has major implications for race relations in the United States is happening. People are dying in the streets of Cairo and Syria. I'm not saying we don't cover the royal baby, but at what cost does it come when those things are not leading the news? But Jian, oh, that's exactly oh. why you do that, right? That's exactly why you have to leaven the package. You have to have a balance. You have to offer a, a, a myriad of, you know, you can't have this onslaught of flood, famine, and pestilence, and they, those are all really news, those are news stories. But from, as long as I know, the, every mainstream media often tries to find something. So this story yeah. came in the dog days of summer, straight yeah, the news. Question, all right, Ellie, let Ellie yeah. in here. The, the, the question is also a question of, of kind of tonnage and display and emphasis. Uh, I think most people understand that you need a mix, but there is a cost. I mean, Jian raises a, a really important question. There's lots of research that suggests that people get their sense of what's important in the world, uh, the hierarchy of importance from what their news media tell them is important, and the way they display it and the emphasis they get it. The question is, when you lead with this and when you give it so much coverage, what are you reducing? The news hole shrinks. What are you not covering? And then what are you saying by inference is less important than this as a major story? You end up inadvertently trivializing what goes after this by the sheer weight and tonnage you give this story. And, and I don't think you can underestimate that. Uh, if, you, if you follow celebrity and personality journalism week after week after week, and it tends to crowd out news of importance, then people do end up getting a somewhat skewed view of what's important in the world. Jonathan? And the skewed view can be quite literal. I mean, I think it was Jonathan's paper, I think, that, that where the headline said, uh, um, the whole world celebrates. Now, um, I, I'm not sure if it was the entire whole world. And by the way, it's a good story and a good news story, and that's absolutely true. The question was, wasn't should we cover it? The question is how much is too much? Exactly. But Jonathan. Just to put in context, by the way, how much we cover the royal baby. Yes, there was four or five days when it was nothing but royal baby, including mm -hmm. the number four story on our website a couple of days ago, which was about Kate Middleton's baby bump. Oh. Yeah. So you know it's a big story when the baby bump actually makes it to the top ten. However, I would like to point out Lac Megantique was for several days a huge story. Yeah. Toronto Star sent five reporters there. I think we did our job on that story. And even sometimes when we cover important stories, and I think the Trayvon Martin Zimmerman story, uh, you know, that was an important story. On the other hand, you turned on any U.S. news network for months and months and months, it sometimes felt that that was all you saw. So sometimes even important stories get overkill. Yeah, and the other thing that the royal baby did is it kind of intersected all these other stories. Nothing was exactly breaking during those couple of days. And so, you know, I was wondering, right. you know, what if Wiener had broken a couple of days earlier? Would that have disrupted in the U.S. the royal baby coverage? Uh, I got to take a break, but first, before, before I go to break, Ellie, um, in a line or two, what does this say about us, the media in general, in 2013? Where are we? Are we fundamentally different than we, than we were a generation ago? Well, you know, you always have to be careful that you romanticize the past. But, but I guess the answer is somewhat yes. I, I think that because of ruthless competition in the media, um, the consumer impact on what gets selected for news has become more and more important. It's a consumer-driven industry. And, and people are telling it uh, what to cover, and often what it covers is objectively not as important uh, and, and not, not as consequential uh, as it might be. And look, most people watching it know what they're seeing isn't important, uh, but nevertheless, that's what they're interested in. This question of, of their interest driving the news, I think, is much more pervasive today than it might have been 30 or 40 years ago. All right, we've got to take that quick break, but when we come back, this question. Social media, what was its role in last week? What impact did it have on what we did? Welcome back to our special Media Watch. Q's Jean Gameshi is in Vancouver. Carlton's Ellie Alboim is in Ottawa. And here in Toronto, Margot Goodhand of the Winnipeg Free Press and Jonathan Kay from the National Post. Social media, how has it changed the way we view news? Margo. I, I, I love social media. I'm a Twitter addict, so I do find that it's great for breaking news, but I have found it's very gossipy. And what I think some of the traditional media is using is they're chasing it, uh, using it as a crowdsource thing. So they'll monitor it and go, hey, this is what people are talking about. Well, not really. 
it's it's what people on Twitter are talking about, and they can be a fairly dyspeptic uh, crowd. So I really took offense at the baby bump story. I wanted the, the mainstream media to leave that one alone. It was mean girl stuff, and it was annoying. And instead, you know, I woke up yesterday morning, and there is my free press, and the life front is, you know, mummy tummy. So I thought, ah, oh, you know. <laughs> you lost that one. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Jean? Um, I think that there's the orthodoxy is to sort of think at this point that in a in a multimedia multi-platform universe that we're getting more a wider variety of stories uh, and that's a good thing in some ways I think that's actually the opposite of the truth I think that uh, uh, we have more media in different ways focusing on one story now and so we get it in a deluge and I think that's what happened here and that's uh, that often happens times at times with the, the culture of outrage too whether it's Wiener or Zimmerman or whatever is happening it social media becomes about one thing it's almost like the metaphor I use is seven-year-olds who are playing soccer and the ball gets kicked and everybody runs over to the ball and then it gets kicked over there everybody runs over to the ball and that's the way it seems to play out on social media Fortunately, it was a good story with the royal baby. It was a more positive one, but when it turns into the culture of outrage, it can be pretty deleterious to getting actual context. Jonathan. I like the soccer metaphor. Uh, I'm <laughs> probably going to steal that. Yeah. Uh, what I've noticed about social media is that it compresses the time frame for stories. It used to be that if there were breaking news at 9 a.m., I would be able to have the entire day to think of something to say for the next day's edition. Uh, now the attitude of a lot of people in the newsroom is, what can I say in the next four minutes on Twitter that's going to get me retweeted 500 times? And often, it's what gets you retweeted that becomes the seed for a column that you don't have a day to post, but you might have two hours to post because you don't want to miss the lunch rush. You know, lunchtime is when peak hits happen, so you might want to get your thoughts on the web by noon instead of by deadline at 6 or 7 p.m. So there's been this massive time compression and when you compress time in journalism, you're going to squeeze out sometimes thoughtfulness. So I think that has happened because losing, of social media. Losing the thinking time. Mm -hmm. Ellie. I think there's another issue as well. In traditional media, you delegate to editors to make a series of decisions about what they think you need to know. On social media, you tend to pull down the information you're interested in uh, and only that you're interested in. So you don't know what you don't know. And if you concentrate on social media, what you see is what's trending that day, what a lot of people are interested in, but you may have no idea of what is happening uh, that may impinge on you in some other way because nobody is helping you make the decision uh, because you don't, as I said, you don't know where to look uh, for things if you don't know what's going on. Good discussion. Thank you all for this. I mean, uh, a good chat. Jean in Vancouver, Ellie's in uh, Ottawa, and Margot and Jonathan here in Toronto. And thanks to you as well. I'm sure you've got, all got thoughts on this, so don't be shy about sharing them. You can always find us at cbcnews.ca slash the national.